The Persian Empire was really good at a lot of things. Fighting, trading, civil administration, abolishing slavery. One thing the Persians were not so good at was spreading Persian culture. If you were dropped into Judah in 400 BCE, there would be little to no sign of Persian influence in the country. But that's okay. The Achaemenids didn't care about spreading their culture. The Persian Empire was united by common interests and common values, rather than a singular language or religion. That's not to say Judaism didn't change under Persian rule, it changed a lot, but it didn't really become more Persian, with one exception. One of the most popular holidays in the Persian Empire was Nowruz, the Iranian New Year. Almost everyone in the empire celebrated it, which was a problem for the Jews because most rabbis disapproved of holidays that weren't in the Bible. So to rectify this, the high priest composed a biblical parable to justify the holiday the Book of Esther, and that's how we got Purim. So let's talk about the Greeks. By the 4th century BCE, the Greeks and the Jews had already gone way back. Some of the Greek gods began as Hebrew imports and vice versa. The now extinct Philistines had been a Hellenic people, and the port of Jaffa was already an important site in Greek mythology. And as Persia became more involved in Greek wars and Greek politics, classical Greek culture came to be known in Jerusalem, though the scholars of Athens didn't necessarily respond in kind. Herodotus, for his part, didn't see any difference between the Jews, Samaritans, or Phoenicians, and considered all of those cultures to be reasonably closely related to that of Egypt. But unlike the Persians, the Greeks were colonizers. When Athens, Sparta, and Thebes built empires, they did it with Greeks, for Greeks. So when Alexander the Great conquered the entire Persian Empire in the 330s and 320s BCE, everybody ended up with at least some yogurt in their hummus. In 332, Alexander's conquest of Persia brought him through Judah. He clashed with the Persians at Gaza, but the Jews themselves were unscathed. For all his dreams of building empire and establishing a common culture throughout Asia, Alexander continued to respect the constituent peoples of his empire, just as the Persians had. That might have to do with the fact that Macedonia had historically actually been part of the Persian Empire. Only a couple generations earlier, Macedonian soldiers would have fought side by side with Jews, Medes, Egyptians. Persian values had become Macedonian values which may be one of the reasons the other Greek states had never fully accepted Macedonia as one of their own. At this point, Judah had been under foreign rule for so long that the idea of returning to independence had ceased to be relevant, so long as Alexander kept up his end of the bargain. Let him be Alexander the Great, King of Macedon, Lord of Asia, Pharaoh of Egypt, and King of Kings of Persia. At the same time, Alexander's conquest made Greek culture available in a way that Persian culture had never been. And it's here where Judaism really comes into contact with Greek philosophy. The more metaphysical ideas purported by Plato and Aristotle never penetrated into Judaism the way they did with Christianity, but some aspects ultimately did find their way into the Bible in the form of Proverbs, Job, the Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. The Greeks also introduced something to Jewish culture that I don't think we could have done without theater. When Alexander the Great conquered Judea, construction began on a previously undeveloped section of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. This upper city was built on a Greek-style grid, and the very first building to be completed was an amphitheater. Jerusalem's theater scene initially consisted of the classic Greek tragedies and comedies, which were performed in the original Greek and thus were only understood by the ruling Jewish elite. But over time, a uniquely Jewish form of theater came into being. Live performances of wisdom literature, moral fables that applied the lessons of the Bible in a way common people could understand, borrowed from a style that was already popular in Egypt, and many of which found their way into the so-called Deuterocanon. In fact, if you click on the link above, you can watch Nella perform a piece of wisdom literature, the Book of Tobit. Most significant for the next several centuries was the introduction of Greek ideas on government, but this topic is so complicated that it will get its own episode in due time. Alexander's own empire didn't last very long before being divvied up by his generals, but he gave the known world of that time a common language, meaning educated Jews could speak to people all the way from Afghanistan to Spain. For most of this period, Judea ended up as part of Egypt, and after defeating an invasion by the Seleucids at the Battle of Raphia, Pharaoh Ptolemy IV tried to celebrate by entering the temple in Jerusalem. However, he was barred from entry as a non-Jew, and as revenge, he sought to round up all the Jews of his native Alexandria to be executed in the Hippodrome. Only one problem. Alexandria had too many Jews to count. In fact, Alexandria had the largest Jewish population of any city in the world. By the second century BCE, Alexandria, Antioch, Babylon, and Cyrene each had a larger Jewish population than Jerusalem. And for the first time in history, the majority of Jews no longer lived in Judah. Or as we should learn to start calling it, Judea. Special thanks to my patrons, including Navi level patron Omni Atlas. If you like this video, you too can donate via Patreon, link below, along with channel merch and my book, An Armada of Cats Travels in Israel. Otherwise, you can always like, share, and subscribe. I will see you next time.